everybody. Welcome to the Let's Clear the Air podcast brought to you by CCAJ. My name is Faraz Rizvi. I'm the Special Projects Coordinator. And uh, today I have with me Marvin Norman, our Policy Analyst. Marvin, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Thanks, Faraz. Um, my name is Marvin Norman. I'm the Policy Specialist here at CCAJ, and I specialize in policy. Great. And uh, today we're going to be talking about all kinds of good stuff. Uh, there's been a lot of change recently going on with um, electrical infrastructure and all of that. And um, pretty much we're going to be discussing electrification, what that is, what that means, and, and what that's going to look like for our community. So Marvin, let me just go ahead and ask you for, you know, layman's people, why is electrification such a big deal? Why do we need to talk about it? So electrification is big because um, as if you've been paying attention to the federal government and the state government over the last couple of months and years and the state level, there are various mandates from the state and the, and the federal government has put a lot of money into electrification already. Cars and trucks uh, burning fuel and that they use to move around is a big source of uh, pollutants in a lot of communities. And so in here in Southern California, actually, the big source of our air pollution is from those motor vehicles and by we, we have federal attainment that we need to meet um, for air quality that might be at risk of not being met very soon if the air quality isn't improved. And so the electrification offers a chance to reduce some of the air quality impacts. Of course, the big part of the air quality, um, it would just be to, to reduce usage as, as well. And so whatever you can do to reduce those trips also helps improve air quality even before you are able to get everything electrified. Yeah, th no, that makes a lot of sense. So essentially, we really need to electrify because we can't burn any more fossil fuels. <clears throat> yeah, we, we couldn't burn any more fossil fuels like 10 years ago, honestly. Yeah. It, it, based on the stuff we're seeing happen now, mm -hmm. we, we should have stopped at least 10 years ago. Right. You know, fires in, in BC and Oregon now, and even mm -hmm. here in California, and you know, you look around the world and you know, they had Elsa, the flood in New York, and the big floods in, in Germany recently, and also in, in parts of Africa, and extreme temperatures in uh, the Indian subcontinent, uh, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. It's, it's not good. Right. I think uh, last week we actually hit um, the record for the hottest temperature recorded in Death Valley, uh, which is deeply concerning and really does speak to why we need to really decarbonize and, and really shift our energy sources. One of the big issues that you talked about was that here in Southern California, in our own community, especially a lot of our viewers in the IE will, will resonate with, is that a lot of the pollution comes from trucks, from dirty diesel trucks. Um, what, what is it looking like right now with the electrification of, of trucking? I mean, I know that, you know, we're looking at a lot of electrical vehicles coming in. Uh, you know, everyone wants a Tesla, right? That's like the big thing. And, and there's a lot of money being poured into electrical cars. Um, but, but what does it look like for electrical trucking? I mean, are we there yet? Is there any issues with the technology? Uh, can you speak to that a little bit? So trucks, actually, they, there's a lot of, at least here in California, there's a lot of resources going into electrification right. of trucking and tr truck models on the market now that would be useful for most uses actually in Southern California. So let's say you have a trucking company or, or uh, someone who owns their truck and they work um, going to the ports back and forth to a warehouse in Mariloma or something. Uh, there are already trucks on the market that could meet that market, that um, use case for them. And when you look at the data, about 80% almost of truck traffic in Southern California remains within Southern California. There are already truck models that can meet that use case and more are being developed and will be on the market very soon. And the state and the utilities are putting a lot of money as well into the, the charging side of things right. so that they would be able to charge that truck while, while they're loading it, for example. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, speaking of, this is just one side of electrification when it comes to um, the vehicle sector, but there's a whole issue about powering people's homes. And so there are a lot of, you know, battles going on around um, the grid and, and the fossil fuels that we burn to just power our neighborhoods. And I know there are a lot of equity issues with, um, especially with like, you know, the power outages last year that, that really hit our EJ communities really hard. Um, so, so what do you think, we know that there is an infrastructure being built for like 
electrical cars and trucks. What does it look like for homes? I mean, do you think we'll be able to see something like the grid be decarbonized or something? Um, in California, the, the grid has to be decarbonized because it's mm. been um, not written into law. It definitely is an executive order. Uh, the grid has to <clears throat> reduce its carbonization and, mm. and go to net zero. I believe they are now, I believe the target was 2045 mm. and they are now working on mm. moving it up to 2040, I believe I saw legislation. Mm. A lot of the coal plants have already mm. gone away and been replaced by wind and stuff. Mm. And, and large scale solar and of course there's been a growth of uh, solar on homes and mm -hmm. and businesses too and so all that is helping and now actually especially in the spring <coughs> at least for the last few years you know the state is a net, net exporter of, of power in the day because there's so much solar that they, they have to pay mm -hmm. other states to take the extra power it's, it's what happens and mm -hmm. which then comes back to ties back to the electrification of vehicles because if you have a fleet of electric vehicles that need to be charged and you're having to pay other people to take your electricity already, you could literally give it to these cars or trucks or whatever for free during that time of the day. Today, what would you say are the biggest issues with the electrification? Um, is it the building the infrastructure? Is it the technology isn't available? Is it political resistance? If you were to kind of look at what's the big holdup, why haven't we moved? Because we needed to do so yesterday. Um, it really is the technology isn't available, um, mm. and and there also has been a, a big snafu in, in the SoCal region because uh, in about a decade or so ago when they last tried to do something big with the ports and they tried to move to those um, near zero or zero um, um, natural gas motors and then these trucks didn't work very well. And so they really felt like they got burned and so there's been a lot of skepticism since then in and in, in new technology that comes on and so right what it is missing now though is the t technology because realistically businesses are if the technology was there businesses would be all over it right. because it's it would save them a lot of money um and you know we, we kind of see the same thing when the railroads switch from um coal or in some cases oil on their steam locomotives to diesel locomotives um I don't re believe there were any regulations that that phased out the steam locomotives. It's just it was so economically beneficial to get rid of them that they, that's what the railroads did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is still shipping essentially. These uh, shipping companies who use the trucks, if the diesel, if the electric was there, they would they would be all over it because it would right. save them so much money. Right. Yeah. No, th that makes a lot of sense. I I have seen that the issues with. Um, some of the other like like battery or like photovoltaic energy is that it just doesn't pr provide enough to use for these intensive like aviation trucking or even like for example like steel production um, so this is something where, where you know another resource could help um, but it also seems like you know it's about choices like political choices that our leaders gonna have to make and so you know, there is a lot of promise right now in these different types of energy. I know, for example, today, actually, Europe just announced that they're going to be investing um, heavily in decarbonizing their grid by 55% uh, by 2040, I believe it was. Um, and so that's going to be all through solar energy. Um, but it also seems like a little bit that the utilities are proving to be a big holdup in the total transition. Um, can you can you speak to that? Like, do you think the the utilities and the oil companies are, are putting up a big fight or, you know, is the transition kind of going underway? Um, the utilities, I, I think in California, they, they have no choice. Um, it's mandated by law that they have to make the change. So mm -hmm. the question is how long will they try to drag out not making the change and how much public funds will they demand for the change in the process? I know a lot of people have talked about the state should just take over utilities, um, and so you know that's a perennial um, issue for some people. The oil companies, obviously, they have a vested interest in not stopping oil because that's what they do. That's what they mm -hmm. that's what they produce. And so if the world is using less oil, then there goes their income stream. And so you know we've seen Exxon Mobil is you know really bad on this uh, in, on this front, um, whereas other companies like Royal Dutch Shell. I've just been told by their court cases that you must 
work on decarbonizing, for example, and, and do better. And so, but obviously a, a company that this is your main product and people are saying, let's not use that product anymore. They are going to be fighting against people saying not to use their product. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw the same thing with cigarettes, for example. Um, right. So overall, you know, there's, there, we're seeing that even though there's a lot of resistance and, and, you know, regulators are kind of dragging their feet, the change is happening. We are moving towards a renewable energy future. Um, but it is political, and that means that it entails political choices by all of us. So is there something that you would say, is there a fight that you would say that people really need to uh, jump in on or anything that they can do to um, push for a just transition? Uh, yeah, I mean, call your state legislators and, and um, help them um, know that you care and that this is something that's really important to you. Right. Um, I mean, we've all seen the heat the last couple of weeks and you know, people are like, wow, this is the hottest summer of my life. And the other thing to remember is that this could be the coldest summer of your life. Mm -hmm. and, and so if, wow. you, if you don't yeah. want this to be the coldest summer of your life, then you know, there are some changes that need to be made. And like I said, we, we needed to decarbonize 10 years ago. And so, um, and I mean, everything we can do to reduce our usage is it's helpful and I know some people will say well you know it's the big companies that are polluting which is true um, I mean Exxon does produce a lot of pollution but it produces that pollution by selling gasoline that we then use to put in our cars right. <laughs> so if we're if we're using less gasoline in our cars they're selling less gasoline which means they're polluting less because we're using less and right. I mean, we saw this I mean to, to somewhat last year during the pandemic although it quickly erased after everyone started going, uh, driving everywhere for everything instead of taking transit and stuff. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, everything we can do to help um, re reduce our usage and to help uh, our, our elected officials understand their role in helping make that transition is great. And Right. I mean, now is the time to mobilize. Now is the time to say, hey, we need that climate action now. We need, we need strong climate action. We need... To hold polluters accountable, we need to make sure that um, you know these oil companies don't keep drilling in you know pristine um, you know environments that are have been historically protected, and uh, that we make sure that we're pushing not just statewide but also locally um, leaders to adopt more stringent green measures. I mean, you can get involved. In your local city's energy portfolio and say hey we don't want you to buy any more fossil fuels we want you to invest in uh, renewable energy uh, so these are all things that that you know we need to do because it's not going to happen overnight it takes a movement to make something big like this uh, happen um, are there any initiatives coming up right now that you would say like keep your eye on this um any specific initiatives i i don't know if I remember any off the top of my head, but beyond the, the usual initiative of uh, Drive Less, mm -hmm. um, about third, more than a third of uh, GHG emissions here in California and most of the U.S. come from um, transportation. Mm -hmm. Of course, here in our EJ communities, we, it, we kind of have the worst of both worlds in that oftentimes we are forced to, to make these longer trips, longer commutes to get to jobs, while at the same time in our communities we have... Um, you know, a lack of sidewalks like Bloomington, you know, where they, they, and where they try to bribe us with sidewalks to allow warehouses, for example. But, and with the irony being, of course, that our, these communities, our, our communities are often where they already have a higher percentage of car-free people in the first place. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have people who are already walking, already biking, and, and already taking transit who are forced to, to suffer in, in substandard conditions. As far as I'm concerned, they are already out there walking we, we don't need to even focus on the fact that it could help more people walk or bike or take transit to get around it's that they're already doing it and they deserve a safe place to be able to travel just right. like everyone else right Build, building you know uh, walkable communities and, and you know cleaner communities that are you know many of them would be denser but um, you know it would also allow for people to kind of connect with their environment um, in, in a more uh, kind of close way and the other side of it is warehousing. 
I mean, we, we've, you know, people know CCEJ has been taking a very strong stance on the warehousing issue because it is contributing to uh, so, so many pollutants in our environment. And it's not just uh, GHG emissions, it's PM 2.5, it's NOx, it's all these terrible things that cause COPD, asthma, cancer rates to go up. Um, and, and people without sidewalks are walking right next to these warehouses and taking in all those pollutants. So the other side of it is, is making sure our legislators and local leaders are saying enough. We're not building any more of this. We want safer, more breathable, walkable communities that have so many different types of uses that everyone can enjoy. Right. And, and again, this is another cruel irony. Uh, the Inland Empire has been sold and told that you, you have to approve warehouses. This is, this is um, you know, you have no educated people out there, and so you have to approve warehouses because that's the only jobs they can do. And, and so what we see is that they're telling a region with, with six universities and then uh, several more universities in the periphery where our uh, residents attend, if you want to move up in life as, as far as getting the education goes, once you graduate, you need to leave the region, which is what we continue to see. Um, um, I went to school at Cal State San Bernardino, and I know this is a topic that I've had with several of my um, colleagues in, in classes. You know, we, we were all noticing that, hey, we have a brain drain in the region. And if that's the issue, if that's what your reality is, that's, that says a lot about your community, and there's no future. But at the same time, the other irony is that by building all these warehouses, you're actively creating an environment that's hostile to people who would be educated. And so either you find a job in LA or Orange County and suffer two hours of commute each way, or you leave the region to go somewhere else like, like Des Moines or Omaha or Austin or anywhere else where you get more for, you get more than a soul, soul crushing commute as an entry level person. You know, we have um, the electric bus maker Proterra, for example, they have a factory in the city of industry. Um, and right down here from the street, from, right down the street from our offices here actually, um, is the, the bus company makes some of the hydrogen buses, for example, mm -hmm. that are used in, in um, the Palm Springs area. And so we, we have these nascent um, starts of other opportunities in the region than, than just the big box um, model. Unfortunately, I recently heard on the radio that there's an expectation that there's going to be a need for over 300 million square feet more of warehousing space in the in the um, U.S. by the, the next three or four years, and you know just geographically based on where the IE is located, it is likely that more of that will be tried to be pushed into our communities. So we, yeah, we really need the political leaders to stand up and say, hey, you know what, enough is enough. We we mm -hmm. we want something different, and we want something that has a actual future, um, not is not that's going to be subject to automation within the end of the decade completely i mean honestly it's it's cruelty from the older generation to the millennial generation it's something that i said in the last podcast episode as well is that you know being a young professional in the ie is the worst i mean it is the worst place to be as a young professional because there is no opportunities for you to use those and so there is that brain drain and a lot of people who are homegrown brilliant genius people i know so many of them from riverside from marina valley who are just absolutely brilliant people in the community who if they had the opportunities they would do amazing things they could they, i mean seriously I, I really don't doubt that we have the same amount of talent as los angeles or orange county or any of these other places um we just don't have the opportunity right and and i think it's really appropriate for us to end on the note of warehousing and environmental justice and, and all of the injustices that our local political leaders are subjecting us to in talking about electrification because the issue of electrification is not just some issue far away in the future. It's not somewhere far away in you know Sacramento or Washington. It's here. The issue of electrification and that infrastructure is affecting us. It's affecting us in the warehousing, the pollution, um, and the, the possibilities of new industries that we can tap into and, and really have this region to be at the forefront of something. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a really good, good thing that you brought that up because it does kind of tie into the issues of employment and the future of our graduates and, and just our, the future of our community. 
Right, yeah, we want to, you know, we have several universities here in the region, like I said before, and CARB is, is soon going to open their offices in Riverside, so that's going to bring, uh, you know, in theory, make this a logical place to be a hotbed of, of innovation and the industry for um, um, electrification and, and green, uh, green economy. Um, you know, there's with the logistics industry that is here already, whether, whether or not we they think it's the best industry to ha to have. It, it is here at the moment. So, at the very least, we should be seeing more investment in our communities with these uh, zero emission. I know you always see these uh, press releases from the big companies like, "Oh, wow, we're trialing our electric vans here, and we're trialing this there, and we're trialing this there, and the other." And that there is always like one neighborhood in LA. Yeah. Bring it out to the IE where we have the worst air and where you keep subjecting us to even worse air with more trucks. You know, just it, it would be good just for once to, to see see it happen out here and yeah. instead of in front of the cameras in LA. Do it do it where it actually counts with right. the people who actually are being impacted the right. most. Do it where it matters. And you know, for anyone who's watching, you know, tell the industry, do it where it matters. Tell the tell your leaders, uh, we need to hear. Um, Marvin, thank you for joining us on this episode of Let's Cl Clear the Air podcast, where we talk about all things that are affecting our local community from the climate crisis to electrification to uh, warehousing. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And now we have a water crisis. It's a drought, guys. <laughs> yep. Next, next podcast. <laughs>